welcome to this week's special edition of Upfront. I'm your host, Jim Hoy, and we're at the studios here at Shaw Calgary. I'm joined by Miss Kate Wilson of Alberta Parks and Environment. She's an invasive species specialist. And Kate, for the people at home, today we're here talking about a hot button issue right now that affects Southern Alberta watersheds. And you have a specialty in this as a backgrounder. You spent a little time in Idaho, did your graduate work in Florida. And now you're here with our Alberta Parks and Environment. Four and a half years, correct? Correct. Yeah. So tell us, the hot button issue is whirling disease. What is whirling disease, Kate? Yeah, whirling disease is a tiny little parasite that can be transmitted into Alberta waters by uh, gear. So anglers unknowingly moving, you know, the fly fishing equipment, uh, water, you know, watercraft, anything like that, um, or by aquaculture practices, the movement of fish. And so it comes in. Um, we have this little worm that lives in the mud, and it is native to Alberta. So this microscopic spore, whirling disease, requires both the worm and a salmonid, so it has a two-host cycle. So it's kind of a complex problem, um, and we just detected it for the first time in Canada in August. So it is definitely a timely uh, time to be talking about this. You know, question, anywhere I travel, uh, being the host of the Dime Store Fisherman, I get a lot of questions about this particular issue. And people really are kind of in the dark on this thing. So you probably experience quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of information seeking as it is. Yeah, absolutely. People have a lot of questions about, you know, what it is. Can they eat the fish if it's in an infected area? Can they be affected by it? Can it affect wildlife? Um, the good news is the, the answer to that is no, <laughs> all around. So really, it just affects fish. OK. Talk to us about how it was introduced here to our watersheds, and specifically what watersheds right now okay. uh, it is that, that it's affecting. Sure. So. Um, really we'll never know exactly how it was introduced but again literature suggests it's either stocking activities from a positive facility uh, aquaculture facility or anglers bringing in gear that has these spores on it um, so for the first time it was detected in Banff National Park um, in August again and that was in Johnson Lake which is uh, part of the headwaters of the Bow River so you can imagine finding it there you can't really contain it um, immediately you got to start monitoring downstream figuring out you know what's the extent of the, of the problem and so that's exactly what we did okay and now there's some information that links it as well to the old man system yes and of course being in the bow it would happen its way through cars land and probably right down past cars land and, and into the South Saskatchewan is that a fair connection um, that is a fair connection so the movement of water in infected areas is definitely going to be the primary cause of, of spread um, but also people moving their equipment around um, and in the movement of fish, of course. So it's illegal to live move fish, li sorry, move live fish around from one place to another for reasons just like this, because you can introduce parasites, disease, you can also introduce species into one watershed that aren't supposed to be there. So um, yeah, absolutely, the, the movement of water. Um, the old man situation is right now, we just have three positives within the Crow's Nest River. So it's not the entire basin like the declaration uh, by the federal government kind of leads people to believe it is just three sites within the old man. How contained can it be or how really region specific can it be when it's, you know, once it's actually in a water system? It depends where it is. Like we're also dealing with some situations where uh, we had positive aquaculture facilities. They tested positive for rolling disease. They stocked out to like recreational ponds. A lot of those are actually totally contained, right? There's no outlets, there's no inlets. Uh, but when we do find them in the wild in flowing water, that is definitely more of a um, uh, tricky situation because we're not going to be able to stop the river or stop the tributaries flowing into the river where we're finding them. So um, again, it's going to be about containing it by trying to get people, by anglers, boaters, uh, people who recreate, to understand how it spreads. Okay, great. Well, and I guess you know the 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 question that everybody asks me a lot is, you know, can you get rid of this thing? Is it possible to eradicate it? So unfortunately, it is not possible to eradicate it. Like there's no, I work on aquatic invasive species and eradication is something we talk about all the time. You wanna find something early and you want to be able to do something about it as soon as you find it. Um, in this case, for this particular disease, this parasite, there is no um, silver bullet method. There's no treatment. Um, so it is um, kind of letting it run its course and trying to contain it to the locations that we know, it, we know where it is already. 
Yeah, I know a lot of people here in Alberta have heard about its presence in Montana for years. Yes. And there was a lot of you know effort undertaken to try and make sure that we were able to keep our our rivers without it. Yes. Uh, talk about the cycle that's run down there and what we've learned from, from that particular case study, if you have any information on that. Sure, good question. So, yeah, in, in Montana and Colorado, we work with a lot as well. Um, they both saw devastating impacts to the wild trout populations, up to 90% uh, collapse in, the, in their wild trout. Um, and so it, back in the 90s, this was a really big issue for both states, for all Western states, really. And they've seen um, generally that it's not having the same impact anymore. And because this is such a complex uh, parasite, we're not really sure why. And in fact, we're not really sure what kind of an impact it's going to have on Alberta wild fish as well, because maybe things are different here. Temperature, habitat, climate, um, I really think some research needs to be done about it. And an example of that would be, you know, you look at the literature and some would tell you that the spore could actually live in the sediment for 30 years. Oh my. Whereas Colorado started doing their own research and they're finding, no, it's more like a year in their situation. What is it in Alberta? Uh, what is it in Montana? So it is kind of a, we want to have as much site specific information as we possibly can moving forward. Sure, a lot of factors contributing to that, yes. soil, yep. thermals, sure. all those things, right? Yeah, sure. potentially, but who knows, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And even this worm, the tube effects worm that's required to uh, perpetuate the cycle. So the spores come into the water, they're ingested by this tiny worm. The worm then emanates even smaller spores out into the water column. And so most fish contract it without even knowing within seconds and then most of them would show symptoms, well, depending on the species, so it affects salmonids being salmon, trout, and mountain whitefish. So in Alberta, we're concerned about trout and whitefish, um, and there's some examples out there like brown trout are a carrier, but rarely um, display symptoms. So really interesting, right? So West Slope cutthroat, um, rainbows, very susceptible. Bull trout, pretty susceptible. Brown trout, susceptible, no symptoms. So it really is kind of species dependent as well. And you touched on something there, the West Slope cutthroat trout. And I know that I've spent a little bit of time here with Jenny Earle and some mm -hmm. wonderful people who do some great study uh, work, biologists who do some great study mm -hmm. work and have kind of tracked some of their native ranges. And you've said that they're, they're susceptible. Yes. So um, do we know exactly right now, regionally speaking, um, do we have any location on, on where it's occurring? and where it might affect the West Slope? So right now, we just know about the Bow and the Old Man River. Okay. Um, so the East Slopes are a huge focus for us. And in <laughs> fact, in August, as soon as we knew that whirling disease was present in Alberta and Banff, um, great effort was expended to deploy pretty much all of our fishery staff out primarily to the East Slopes from the Crow's Nest to Grand Prairie, um, where those susceptible species are. And they sampled over the course of about four months over 200 sites and six watersheds. So a lot of effort was put into the monitoring piece and trying to figure out the extent of the problem. Um, unfortunately, the analysis is fairly complex as well. So you can't just go take a water sample and look for whirling disease. You actually have to sample the tissue of the fish, which means when we go to a wild site, we're looking to get ideally uh, at least 60 specimens to do the testing. When we go to an aquaculture facility, 150 specimens. So we're talking about a lot of fish in order to determine whether it's present or not. Um, and of course, that tissue sampling takes time. And so that's why you're seeing results kind of trickling in. Um, we knew about the bow, now we know about the old man. Hopefully that's going to be the extent of the problem, but we are waiting for more data to come in. Surely. Talk to me now about the Canadian Food Inspection Agency and what this declaration means okay. uh, as it relates to, to yes. whirling disease. So the federal government, Canadian Food Inspection Agency, CFIA for uh, ease, of, ease of use here, they, this is a reportable disease in Canada, so that's why they're involved. Uh, we also have Parks Canada involved because that's where the first detection was. So we have a lot of parties here. Um, primarily what happens is because it's a reportable disease, CFIA decides uh, where, it, where it occurs, uh, what they're going to do in that zone. And so essentially the declaration is very precautionary and you'll see the entire Bow River Basin and the entire Old Man Basin to be declared as infected, even though I mentioned before only three sites in the Crow's Nest River are positive right now. It's not the entire Old Man Basin. But they do that because the declaration really affects the movement of fish. 
So if you have an aquaculture facility, including our provincial hatchery or private uh, aquaculture facilities, they want to be able to control fish that move outside of that zone. So really, the declaration primarily impacts aquaculture practices. Very interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, what does it mean for the rest of Alberta? And right now, you know, what are we thinking about as far as, you know, is this just a moving water situation? Is this something that can affect lakes? Good question. So primarily it is a moving water situation and we would really like to have more information about like temperature tolerance and that kind of thing. But we do know uh, a lot of our fisheries work is, is um, looked at, you know, where, where these susceptible species are so we can really map out where we're most concerned. And again, the east slopes, eastern slopes would be the primary uh, kind of area that we're concerned about because of species at risk and because there are so many susceptible trout species um, and mountain whitefish as well. But for the rest of the province, I would say, um, because this is kind of my, my specialty is actually aquatic invasive species, mm -hmm. we should be really vigilant about moving equipment and water uh, from one place to another, no matter where you're going or where you've been. And I think this is an opportunity for us to learn and to do better um, within government, externally, everywhere, really get the awareness up about how these things happen and what can be done to prevent them. Yeah, really, and kind of you segued perfectly right into my next question. What's the action plan? The action plan. So the government of Alberta has an action plan. It consists of three parts. Uh, distribution, so that's the largely the monitoring piece. So we got to figure out where it occurs right now and it, where it can be contained, contain it. Uh, the second piece is education, and I think this is going to be a really strong tier in the action plan because it is such an opportunity to talk to people about the issue and the movement of water and plants and mud and fish. Um, and then the third piece is mitigation, so that's possible management activities, that's doing things like a big project I have right now is uh, working with all uh, field staff, so I have a big team of representatives from agriculture and forestry, from fire, from irrigation, from monitoring, um, all, all over, you know, fisheries, enforcement, that kind of stuff. Whoever does work in water, we need to make sure we have really good protocols about what happens each time you use your boat and equipment in one place and then have to go work in another. So like decontamination protocols would be part of that mitigation as well. Yeah, and so now, you know, just, just really kind of up to now in our discussion, you know, we found out about this in August. We've mobilized very quickly as a province, and a lot of different agencies are working together. Mm -hmm. um, the volunteer, volunteer aspect of what's going Absolutely, on here. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. So a lot of different intermeshing factors mm -hmm. in order to to get as much information as possible. Yeah. You now and some background information that's excellent, and some people who are who are working really hard right now. For the person who is going out fishing, mm -hmm. the angler, because those are the people that I deal with in communities all over Alberta. And they ask me, you know, frequently, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. um, what can an angler do who's going out on the river when you talk about, you know, making sure that equipment is clean, mm -hmm. whether it's their drift boat, whether it's their waders or their boots, and then they're going to, you know, pick up their stuff and maybe go to another watershed. Mm -hmm. What action can they undertake in order to make sure that their equipment's clean? Good question. So we have a big campaign, Clean Drain Dry. Um, we do like boat inspections on the highways for aquatic invasive species and we already had that campaign, Clean Drain Dry, your boat. Mm -hmm. um, and now we've modified it to be your gear so we can really target the angling community as well. And it's really important, um, again, no matter where you are in the province, out of province, to just take that extra few minutes to make sure that you're not transporting you know, aquatic plants, any mud or standing water. Really, it's that simple. So it's three uh, personal actions that you can take every time. Uh, we know that these spores are viable in the mud for at least a year uh, with Colorado's research and maybe up to 30 years. So no mud should go with your gear anywhere. And same with standing water. Um, you don't want standing water to go from one watershed to another ever. So cleaning all your equipment, just visually inspecting it, removing organics, um, you know, cleaning it off if it's really dirty, draining any standing water from your drift boat, from your kayak, from your belly boat. Um, if you have an actual watercraft, pull in the plug. Um, those are all really important actions. And then if possible, you want your gear to be dry before you go to the next location. Yeah. All great information, mm -hmm. fantastic. There's, there's one other piece too, which is I get a lot of questions about like felt sold waders. Mm -hmm. And so we know that felt sold waders can be problematic just because of the fiber. So um, our fish disease specialist took a, a picture of a felt sold wader and then compared it to a 
hard soled waiter mm -hmm. and she put all the spores that these microscopic whirling disease spores that she could on the fiber of the fault soles and it was probably 200 times more spores could be transported by that material than by a hard sole. So we're not going to, um, we're not looking at prohibiting felt sold waders at this point, but encouraging people not to use them. Or if you only fish in certain locations or you definitely go to the bow a lot, maybe consider having dedicated gear that only is used in that location. Yeah, that's a great comment and that's something I've responded uh, myself and, and certainly knowing a little bit about invasive species in other locations and yeah. they do occur yeah. in other and, locations I mean, in Canada. Everybody probably wants a new pair of waders anyway, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's a perfect, perfect, perfect. reason yes. to go out and get some new waders. It's like the best rationale I've ever heard. Surely, surely. <laughs> Talk now a little bit about how much the Whirling Disease Management Program is going to cost. Yep, so it is um, has a fairly fairly big price tag, but again, mm -hmm. think of this as an opportunity for everyone to do better. So uh, we're looking at about nine to ten million dollars over the course of the next few years, and doing things like right now we don't really have well we didn't really have the ability to do the sampling, the analysis ourselves. So we'd go out, our fishery staff collected all these fish put them in minus 80 degree freezers, like it's quite the process, yes. and then they have to actually be uh, sampled analysis wise. And we were sending fish out to BC, to Washington, all over the place because we just didn't have the capacity to do the analysis ourselves. So that funding will help us be able to stand up our own lab um, and test for other fish diseases as well, not just whirling disease. Um, it can help us with some of the decontamination um, measures that we need to put in place, as well as updating aquaculture facilities and really going big with the education piece. Yeah, that's fantastic. You talked to me a little bit earlier uh, before we came on set about actually having the opportunity to go out and speak with people about this. Yeah, lots of lots of people want answers, they're hungry for information, yes. and I think one of the best things we can do is talk to people about what we're doing, uh, things we know, things we don't know, and what people can do personally to, to make a difference. Yeah, fantastic. Now, if any, what regulations might change here on our Bow River or in other watersheds as a result of whirling disease uh, that you may be aware of? Okay, good question. So right now, uh, we're not looking at any new sport fishing changes. Um, the new one that just came in recently, uh, catch and release, that was actually in the works prior to whirling disease being detected, uh, just to you know, maintain the kind of blue trout fishery, and it was really complex before different sections had different regulations. So That's right. That's in an right. effort to simplify that and to protect the, the trout fishery, um, that was already, you know, there was already cons consultation done about that. So um, that actually really helps in this situation because we're not going to have fish moving, uh, which is the primary um, vector of spread. So if people took fish or took them live, which is illegal, um, and, and were to maybe place them somewhere else, that would be a really big problem. So uh, the catch and release will benefit this, this issue, uh, but it wasn't the primary reason. Yeah, and that's for certain. Yeah. And, and I know just from personal experience and being involved in a panel advisory committee as it related to the Bow River, mm -hmm. just how many stakeholders are consulted, how much work goes into it from the biologist's perspective, uh, the mediators the government bring in, and all of the people who actually come to the table to try and make these kinds of changes. Now on the whirling disease side of things, or is there any kind of mobilization that looks like that? Yeah, so good question. We actually have a whirling disease committee initiated, and we have lots of partners from Bow River Basin Council to Trout Unlimited, um, I can't, I can't name them all. Uh, Fish and Game Association. That's There's so many. ACA, yeah, they're all there at the table. And so we, um, we've been meeting kind of quarterly and giving them updates and getting feedback on what to do and, and what we're doing and um, kind of the status of things. And they've been really good at helping us get the message out and you know, talking to their own stakeholders and constituents and clients about the issue and, and what can be done. And I know like Trout Unlimited took this, they made their own little decontamination kit already and started taking it out to anglers. Like that kind of stuff is priceless. Yeah, it really is. Volunteerism is alive yes. and well, and especially here with this can-do attitude in Alberta. Yeah. Yeah. There's no question about it. Really across Canada, anywhere I go, anytime people you know, come against challenges, they really come together and there's no question about that. Absolutely. And it really is the only way to move forward because we as a government can't work alone in this, right? We need our partners to really uh, believe in it and, and do what they can to. Yeah, mm -hmm. super. Now, 
Uh, just talking a little bit more about uh, information that people have access to. Mm -hmm. Where can people go to get more information about whirling disease? Yeah, so we've been updating our website, the Alberta Environment and Parks website. You can really just Google um, Alberta Environ Environment and Parks or Alberta Whirling Disease and it'll come right up. Uh, we have quite a bit of good stuff on there and we'll have some like best practices for people moving around and some clean rain dry concepts and that kind of thing. So uh, yeah, that's the best best way to get information. We also have a hotline you can call if you have seen a fish that you think might have whirling disease or have questions about it. So any of that is, is good. Yeah, so just again, just to cover this, um, when an angler or any type of person in the public uh, may come into uh, contact with whirling disease. What symptoms are they looking for, yeah. you know, possibly in fish? Good question. So it affects their um, their spinal cord. So we, t we tend to see uh, deformities. So it just doesn't look quite right. It's kind of crooked. Um, it mostly affects fingerlings and fry, so smaller fish. And sometimes they'll also have a blackened tail. And so um, this all leads to them swimming funny, um, which then makes them more vulnerable to predators. It makes it harder for them to eat and to swim. And so they're kind of noticeable. And yeah, so if you see any of those symptoms, we do encourage you to call so we can uh, track it and make sure that you know we get get some people out there if we if we haven't already known that it's it's occurring there. Miss Kate Wilson, thanks so very much for spending some time with us. It's great to get the information from Alberta Parks and Environment and from somebody who's an invasive species specialist. Mm -hmm. And until next time, we want to thank you very much for joining us on Upfront. Mm -hmm.